Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Cyril Entrepreneur, the kickboxing world champion, the one and only Mr. Ola Alvarsson. Hi everybody. It's fantastic to be here for the third time for Sign Barcelona. Uh, I don't know how many of you, how many of you have been to a sign before? Raise a hand. Oh, it's a good number of you, but there's a lot of newbies as well. Um, Sign was actually founded already back in 96 in Sweden, where a group of people came together from different walks of life, looking at what is going to happen with all these digital opportunities and all these fantastic technologies that people develop. So you had Skype founders sitting next to marketing directors of Volvo. You had journalists sitting next to mayors. And this created a very, very vibrant and special mix that has led to a lot of interesting things in the Scandinavian region. We want to recreate that here. Uh, so within the spirit of SIME, feel free to talk to anyone, tell what you're doing, and see if you can use SIME as a platform for doing a lot of cool things. Uh, if you want to connect with each other, I think I have some slides here, or um, if you want to follow what we're doing, you can do it here. Uh, SIME new. Sime NU. People ask me, why the hell are you calling it Sime NU? It was actually a joke when Sime started because NU is New Guinea. So, in an increasing uh, amount of times during the year when we have Sime events, there's a lot of people coming to New Guinea to this site. And it also means now in Swedish. So, Sime NU. If you're blogging uh, or Twittering, uh, this is where we are. Um, and those of you who have not been to Sime, you might not know what happens to speakers. And there's some new speakers here as well. We, when a speaker speaks too long, we have our favorite Indian friend, Mahesh, that keeps reminding them. And it can look something like this. Rolex. So if you're a speaker and everybody starts laughing when you're not funny, you probably have something happening behind your back. And it's time to kind of think of the wrap up because you can do more things than that. You can also come up live and then it becomes really scary. Um, you're going to be photographed, you're going to be filmed, you're going to be interviewed, you're going to be asked strange things maybe. Just say smart things because you're going to be broadcasted in Amsterdam and in Sweden and in London and in, in a growing number of cities. Um, and what I do, I, um, my first career, I was a kickboxer, as, as the introduction said. I was actually a world champion in kickboxing. And when I say that, people say, but you don't look like a kickboxer. And that's the whole point. The other guy should look like a kickboxer. You shouldn't. Uh, did anybody try martial arts here? Raise a hand. Okay, there's a lot of martial artists here in the room. Uh, it's really stupid sport, because even if you win, you get severely beaten up. And there's, when I did it, was no money and there was no fame. But it was really, really exciting. Uh, so every morning when you woke up, you were like, oh, in three weeks, somebody's going to kick and punch me. Oh, now it's only two weeks. And it was really, really uh, an exciting life. So when I thought about starting working, what could be as exciting as kickboxing and hopefully a little bit more rewarding? So I started becoming an entrepreneur. And since then, the last 15 years, I've been traveling around the world trying to find out what's happened in the different countries. Uh, so what I would like to start with today is to take you on a journey in global opportunities. And I would also like to introduce some of the speakers that you're going to meet later on today. So the first thing uh, that, that, that uh, is happening now, more than ever before, is that there are very big forces in motion. What does Facebook want? I mean, they're s soon reaching a billion people on Facebook. They already have 10% of the whole population is on Facebook. What do they really want? I think they want to become the Internet. When Facebook launches a really good search, why go somewhere else? Why go to Bing or Google? Uh, it's grown faster than almost everything since humanity was created. Does anybody know what has grown faster than Facebook? Games on Facebook. So when something like Facebook happens, a lot of other things happen as well. The like button. We all click the like button, but do you think about what you're doing when you click the like button? So you read El País, you like something, you're giving Facebook the information about what you like. And El País in the future will have to buy that back from Facebook to be able to show the right banners to you. They're building a social graph that they will know not only who your friends are, what you like, but everything you've emailed and where you've been with your phone. And they're building a social graph around you, which will be the most powerful marketing system that has ever existed. 
if you're afraid of this, you say, why are they going to have all my data is mine? If you think this is good, you'll say, oh, great, I'll get good ads and not ads for diapers when I don't have a baby. And it's also instant. Messi scored a goal, and 60,000 people within 60 seconds had it in their own status. That's just in 60 seconds. Nothing has communicated that far and that fast before. 50 million people have liked the like button, and it feels like the like button has been around forever. It's one year old, so this has happened in one year. Um, in almost every country, there is a 2MT, like here in, in, in Spain. Uh, there is a Psy world in, in Korea, and it was actually there five years before Facebook. So we think that Silicon Valley invest, uh, invents everything, and we are just copying. Very often, it's the other way around. It's invented somewhere first, but Europeans and Asians have been not so good at scaling things. So a great idea in Spain often stays in Spain. The most successful social network in the world, it's in Latvia a country with 1.6 million people. They have 80, 90% of everyone in the country on their social network. It started when the guy tried to sell t-shirts and he had a chat function, so everybody started talking about the t-shirts instead of buying it, and it became a social network 12 years ago. Um, if you're a media company today, you can't ignore Facebook. It's the second largest driver of traffic to any media company. And they're building a universe. It started out with Harvard kids, now it's becoming a currency. So why pay with Visa when you can pay with Facebook? Um, it's growing out to a number of different things. They're putting a layer on everything. So when you use uh, places, you can go in and log in and find out what's happened here before, what's happening here right now, and what's going to happen here in the future. So what about Apple? What does Apple want? Well, first of all, they're out cooling everything. <coughs> they're just making things so much more beautiful and hitting the heart of people. We, uh, you know, if, if you buy a, a Nokia phone, uh, they market it, they give you a 10 cent deal if you sign up for three years. With Apple, people sleep outside the store for two weeks and then they blog and Twitter about it when they pay full price. There's something completely different in how Apple interacts with people. It's also interesting to see how consumption is changing. Uh, a, a survey said that uh, three-year-olds interacted better with iPads than 75-year-olds. I think that's a little bit sad, but also uh, cool that kids adapt to this extremely rapidly. But it's, on a business level, it's very interesting because now you can create an app where you can actually charge for content, and that was not going on before. So a lot of media companies that thought, oh, we're all going to die, are now saying, no, we're going to make a lot of money, and they're very, very positive to towards the whole app revolution. Uh, and apps can create the most crazy things. We're going to learn later on today from, uh, from advertising how you can actually get on the top 25 list and start making your app a new marketing channel. Um, how many of you play Angry Birds or have played it? Okay, it's almost everybody and then a couple of people that don't want to admi admit it. So <laughs> we had the, 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 the founder of Angry Birds, he spoke at Syme, and he's not called the CEO, he's called the Mighty Eagle. So it's on his business card. And Finns, they're very slow, and they speak slowly. Very smart people, but speak slowly. And he came up on stage, and he looked like this, and he was just standing. And I said, oh no, he doesn't want to speak. He's shy. And he was standing there for one minute. Nothing happened, and people were starting going like this in the audience. And then he said, hello, I am the mighty eagle from the Angry Bird company, Rovio. <laughs> and he was quiet, and he said, if you wonder what I just did, I made $100,000 because the apps are just selling like crazy. They sold 10,000 Angry Birds Halloween costumes in the US. And they're selling, now they're selling board games, real board games from Mattel. You just boing, and then the bird hits the pigs. And it's becoming a movie. Could you imagine being a script writer and somebody tells you, write an interesting dialogue about Angry Birds. <laughs> but it's happening. And all these other opportunities are created because there is a Facebook, because there is an app store, because there are other channels to market. And of course, Apple, they also want their universe. So you're already on iTunes, you can pay for everything there. Why pay your telco? Uh, they're also launching, uh, at, or they have launched, free SMS. So why pay your telco? Why pay Visa if you can pay much cheaper with these channels? And they're in your car, and they're in your house, and then in, in a growing part of your life. The problem with Apple is that they have two big problems. One, it's a closed system, we all know that, and we don't know uh, about the health of Steve Jobs and how important he is. Somebody told me that the innovation model of Apple, it's Steve says, we're gonna do that, and that's the innovation model. 
if that is true, it's going to be difficult going forward. So what does Google want? Well, I don't have a clue, but I'm guessing. I think that they also want to create a completely integrated advertising world where you, when I'm looking at television, you can go in and buy an ad on television, but through Google TV, and you can pay a little bit more than the other guy. You don't have to talk to a sales guy. You just get going, and you can then follow me. So when I get my Android phone, you can see where I am and keep on following me. And if I ever should sit down in front of a PC or a Mac again, well, then you would know who I am, what I've done, who I've emailed, where I've been, and everything else. So Eric Smith, he believes that maybe five, ten times more money will go into advertising because it's going to be so efficient. Um, they're also going into print media, <coughs> Google in print media, because you can look at an ad in a newspaper, see Adidas shoes, and you just pick it up, and then Google could sell it to you. I've also heard rumors that they're moving away from the click model so that you will actually, when you Google Adidas, you will have the shoes, and you can buy it, and Google take a piece of the action in the future. So they become a tremendous large e-commerce engine for the whole world. Self-driven cars. I met the guy that lead this project. Uh, so, and I said, you know, Google want to show off how smart they are. They make a self-driven car. Who cares? This is m one of the most fundamental things that's going to happen. Because how many times do you sit in a car uh, queue or a traffic jam. How long time does it take for you to go to work? Imagine you could work all that time instead and your car is taking you to work and it knows where all the other cars is. It gets 1.6 million data points per second. So it cannot crash and it cannot be in a car uh, jam. So we'll go to work, working, not have any car jams and when we're there, the car is just standing there, right? 97% of the time the cars of the world are just standing. They're only driven 3%. So now when you're at your job, your car will go out and it will take a lot of other people around and you will get a buck or two for it as well. This could be true. Technically, it's true today. Uh, they're also doing mobile payments. So once again, if you're Visa, what's your piece of the action? And they're going into television. And television, uh, that I thought was a really boring media, uh, is now becoming one of the most interesting medias. And I'll get back to that later on. Google is the largest driver to media sites. And also, I was at this think tank with Eric Smith in Abu Dhabi, and he said, whatever you do, mobile first. Look at your company, who's the smartest guy, make him head of mobile or her head of mobile, and then you run from there. And Google, of course, they have a universe. If you're a big guy, you need to have a universe. And it's a growing uh, universe with the YouTube. And, Ad mob doing mobile marketing and just adding more and more interesting things. So what does Microsoft want in all this? Well, first of all, uh, which I think is very cool, they're ending 75 years of sitting still in front of your computer. You know, this was a computer gamer when I grew up and I didn't have any girlfriends. Now a computer gamer is looking something like this. And in Sweden, it was a fantastic incident where the police beat down the door of a guy who was punching his wife. So the neighbors called, and they were playing uh, Kinect boxing games with each other. So he's like, no, 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 we're just playing games. Get down here, and they sort of <laughs> tore him out of there. Uh, and more important like, than the game is the interface, because in the future, you will be able to use an interface like this to do a lot of different things. So computing is going to look very, very different and be much more gesture-driven uh, than typing-driven. They're also making babies with Nokia, uh, and they're trying to go for the next billion people, the next billion people that will be online using a mobile fo phone within four years, online for the first time. Uh, so there's still a lot of business out there. Um, another thing they released that is very cool is the intelligent surfaces. So in Microsoft's vision, 10 years from now, most of the surfaces in your house will be smart. So you can tell your light bulb or your computer to make the wall red, put on TV, and then you put your camera on the table, and it just uploads all the photos. You put your mobile phone on another table, and you have everything. So the surfaces will be smart. They shipped the first table uh, about two weeks ago. They're also buying Skype. Uh, I'm a friend of Niklas Sandström, so first, when I heard about it, it was called Skyper, and they were going to move to Estonia and give away free telecom to the world. And some of my friends joined the company and the founding team, and I said, are you insane? Keep your day job. You know, look at it. How many successful companies come from Estonia? How many people are rich giving away telecom? 
and then they sold it for four billion to eBay. And then they bought it back for one, and then they sold it for another eight and a half. LinkedIn made an IPO, almost $10 billion. $10 billion. So I got gray hair, and this is a true story, sad but true. I was uh, one of the founders of the larger, largest e-commerce company back in the mid-90s, uh, and in 2001, everything went to hell. And everything I believed in, e-commerce, community, social, everything was wrong. And my portfolio lost 98% of its value in six months, and uh, there was a dot-com crash. I'm seeing every sign now that we're going into dot-com boom, and I think it's going to be crazier than before. Um, and when people say, yeah, but it's different this time, I know it's going to be crazier than, than before. Uh, Facebook is going to IPO, Singa is going to IPO. More and more venture capitalists are going to get their money back, so they want to invest in more and more company. And that's good news for you, because many of you are entrepreneurs, so I think it will be a lot easier to get capital. So some of the technology barriers that we've already crossed, Augmented reality, it's basic stuff. We spoke about it uh, last year. I can look at you, I see, oh, you're on Match.com, or I can look at this, this venue, and I learn a lot about it. What's happening now increasingly is vision-based augmented reality. So I can print something in a newspaper, and then when I look at the ad, I get a three-dimensional version of the car, or I can get three-dimensional games, like in, in, in uh, Star Wars, if you have the Star Wars fan here. This can actually happen already now. So the vision that the mobile phone conveys can be products, it can be games, it can be all kinds of, of other things. Cloud computing is one of the most phenomenal things that have happened to technology. This handsome young gentleman to the right is Werner Vogels. He's the CTO of Amazon, and Amazon has been pioneering cloud computing. Uh, I usually say that he's as important to technology as Beethoven to music, so you sort of you get an idea. Because with cloud computing, I can sit in Mogadishu and I can start a company without having to raise capital or spend a lot of money. And if it goes well, I just pay like electricity. And if you combine that with the fact that Google can just or give you uh, clicks or Madvertise or Plist or other networks can give you performance-based marketing. And the fact that in the future, as in tomorrow, Language won't be an issue. Already internally in Google, I can choose French, speak Swedish, and then the guy answering the phone hears French. It's a different kind of French. It's not like, blah, 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 blah. It's more like, blah, 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 blah. So it doesn't work really well in French, but I can communicate. So if you put these people together, you'll have one billion new fresh internet users on their mobile. They'll be able to talk to each other. They can start companies because of cloud computing, and they can market to the whole world because of these performance-based uh, solutions. We are going to go into an er era of hyper-entrepreneurship. We're going to be the last generation that are not having tens of thousands of new services and ideas being produced every year. There's also going to be 50 billion connected items. 50 billion connected items. And that means that almost everything you can think of will have a ship in it, and it will be intelligent and keep track not only of itself, but where other things are as well. Stupid examples that always come up, well, in your fridge, when your milk is down, then you will have... There'll be much more important things like that. For instance, your heart will be connected to your doctor. Most of the time you go to the doctor, you're, you're there for nothing. There's nothing wrong with you. Uh, your toilet will be connected to your hospital, so they can analyze what the hell you're doing. Uh, there's going to be so many chips, and the ultimate, uh, the ultimate proof of that was when I was in a restaurant in Stockholm, one of the best restaurants. I was taken there for a caviar dinner for my birthday, and the waiter said, no, no, you should have Italian caviar, not Russian. Why not? No, Russian waters are polluted, and they're not ship-driven. And I said, what? What is a ship-driven caviar? He said, well, in Italy, they have farms for making the fish, uh, and then they put chips in the stomach, so when the caviar is perfect, it tells the main computer, and they just pick those fish. So it's always the best caviar. So if salmon, or uh, what is it called? It's called sturgeon. The fish is ship-driven. What will not be ship-driven? In this world, of course, we get a more and more complex relationship to media. And you all, you all recognize this. I see some people, they're twittering, they're following something on their computer, and they're listening as well. Partial, continuous partial attention. And we go from a completely sort of advertiser and media company-centric communication landscape where you, like Conan the Barbarian, for some reason, 
and you watch television like this, you eat popcorn, and somebody kills Conan Barbarian, shows you diapers, even though you don't have any kids, for 30 seconds. And before it was okay because you liked Conan Barbarian, now it's not okay anymore. And almost all the cool services have started out in a different way. They've started out by somebody saying, oh, 20 is such a cool service, you should really check it out. And they don't even have a marketing budget. So that was the first wave of internet companies. What's happening right now is that the marriage between traditional and online companies are creating the winners. So you can start a conversation uh, online. It can then be skyrocketed through television, and you can continue that online. The Arab Spring, what's happening in the Arab countries, has started to a combination of Facebook, Twitter, and Al Jazeera. But without Al Jazeera, it wouldn't have worked either. Google bought uh, TV ads uh, for Super Bowl. 100 million people saw it. But then 200 million people saw the ad on YouTube. So there's a symbiotic relationship. Often at the events, there's somebody coming out and telling us, this is going to die, and that's going to die, and they're futurists, and so forth. So this, and you don't have to memorize this, this is when all newspapers are going to die per market. People always say things like this, but usually it doesn't happen. So the cinemas weren't ki killed by the video. Uh, and uh, the radio wasn't killed by Spotify. So good media changes and morphs. And the media industry, it is really morphing. Before, and this is not a very beautiful slide, but before, if you were a newspaper, you sold ads, and then you sold your newspaper, and it was fine. And then 2000 came, and lots of venture capitalists pumped in money, and strange companies marketed. But then, it started going down. The pie started going down. It was tougher and tougher to be a media company. Okay, they made some more money on the internet, but still not enough. So new media companies, they're starting to become more entrepreneurial. They're building different arms. They want to be the best in classified, the best in mobile, the best in events, and then they have the newspaper. Bad media companies, they have their newspaper and try to save it by doing a little events or doing a little classified. The interesting thing is that the media companies are becoming the new entrepreneurs and becoming the new partners of entrepreneurs. So if you have a good idea, it's never been such a good time to go and speak to a media company and do something together with them. We worked a lot with a company called Shipstead. They own uh, Infojobs and Compraventa, Segundo Mano, all kinds of companies here in Spain as well. And they've created, I think it's 80 companies the last 10 years. They've created 1 billion euro worth of entrepreneurial new ventures. And they're also buying entrepreneurial companies and putting their media behind it. And I think that's the new media model, and it's an opportunity for entrepreneurs. I said TV was interesting. Well, why is it interesting? Because I think TV is the media that's going to transform most the next uh, year or two. So you have Barcelona beating the crap out of, of Madrid. You're there live. It's not going to be better. That's not going to change. You're seeing it live with your friends. That's going to be more valuable as well. It's going to be precious. But just have a tape of that. It's going to be completely worthless. So if it's not happening now, it's not going to be as exciting. What is going to be exciting is that you can check into that game. So with all your friends, you have 200 friends looking at the game at the same time, and you're checking in on your second screen. So you'll have your iPad or your computer next to you, and then you can buy, I want the fourth camera angle. You pay a euro, and you can see a fourth camera angle that the others can't see. And then you can bet on BWIN, because you check into BWIN social network. Or you check into Telecinco's social network. Or you can check into Adidas social network. And, but you are going to be checked in to every show. And when that happens, you can buy whatever dress Jessica Parker is wearing. You can also, as an advertiser, you can know who is looking, who are they looking with, what are all the TV programs they've seen before, what have they bought, what have they liked, and I'm going to tell them these stories instead of just showing diapers. So this is going to be very exciting, and this is an opportunity, because the TV companies don't really know what to do. Facebook is not here in a big way yet, and it's an open field. Uh, the TV is also going to be three-dimensional, so that you're going to see it in 3D, and a bunch of other things. And what is called the battle of the living room has just begun. You are going to get badges if you look at all the news programs, and then you're going to get contacted. Dear sir, you're very knowledgeable in news. Would you help me in this panel, or would you come to this show? Or so there's going to be a lot of things happening in the TV space. And it's possibly the best time to be in advertising. 
this is a, a German company, they're here as well. Uh, very hungover if I hear the, <laughs> hear the rumors from last night. That's the risk of having events in Barcelona because half of the speakers, they have so much fun, so they come a little bit late. But this is, this is preference-based marketing. Based on what you read, based on what you do, your advertising is served by you. You can analyze rather than guess if marketing is good. Commerce, one of the uh, strongest things in e-commerce, it what's, it's what's called O2O, -O, so it's a buzzword. How's your O2O -O going? So it's online to offline. You get coupons, you probably get hundreds of coupons from all kinds of uh, companies. Some of them are going to be here with us today, let's deal. But there's Groupon and there's other growing companies. Uh, and private clubs like Privali or Vente Privé, they're using the online to push offline sales. And that's a strong growing, um, that's a strong growing movement. Also, in what is called NFC, near field communication. So when I'm near to your store, you can start shipping me things directly in my mobile phone. And you can start transacting and interacting in different ways. So we go from online to try to push things in the offline stores, rather than as before, just doing everything online. When I started out, as I said, a computer gamer was a fat, fat kid without a girlfriend, and it was not very interesting. Now, games has changed. So if you come up with a game idea, like Angry Birds, you can have a world uh, of, of, of potential users. Uh, it's not longer in the gaming company's hands if you succeed. And this has developed into a very interesting field called game dynamics, because it's been proven that people become happier from games. Before, and this is a, a great book if you like game dynamics, McGonagall, she writes that before we were sitting in a village and we were hunting a bear. And when we hunted the bear and when we hit the bear, everybody's like, whoa, you hit it. And then you came home and you ate the bear. We became happy because we were continuously getting feedback, peers applauding us, and everybody was really happy in this environment. Most people don't have that. You don't have the fix, you don't have the buzz. But with games, you get that. You gain a level, you're with your friends in World of Warcraft. And she sees that that is happening and that's driving society in many other ways. So for instance, football is of course a game, but she says that uh, the stock exchange, it's a game as well. Oh, you're so good, you bought this. And more and more game dynamics can be used in marketing campaigns, in creating companies, in even teaching kids. This is a, a, a good example where the teacher changed from grades to experience points. So if you turned in your homework in school, you got more experience points. So you could be an eighth level mathematician, even though you're only a fourth grader. And the whole school went crazy with trying to do more homework, learn more, and so forth. There are toothbrushes that are uh, with points. So the longer you use them, the more points, and then you can turn it into sugar-free candy, and so forth. And uh, this, of course, also applies to Angry Birds and all the kinds of real games that are being played. McGonagall, she believes that we should create a world game where we all contribute to making the world a better place and we get points for it. So if you sort of, you meet somebody, say, oh, how many points do you have? It's almost like golf. Well, I have 2,400 points. <coughs> what? How did you get that? No, I was in Africa for three, year, three months helping out here. Okay, you got points. So game dynamics, you'll see that in more and more different shapes. And industry after industry is transforming. Also, the investment landscape. When we started here two years ago, there was no money to be had, venture capital is dead, and so forth. Now, there's a new model evolving. How many of you have heard of Y Combinator? Raise a hand. Quite a fair number. So Y Combinator, they combine being a school for entrepreneurs with being investors. So you come there and you apply to the school, and if they like it, they say, you're in, they give you a small salary, they help you move to Silicon Valley, and then you work for three months, and then you have to pass the exams to get the next cash and get the next cash. They created 300 companies with this model. Some of them have been fantastically successful. So this is a new model for entrepreneurship. Another thing that has been, been, been uh, very interesting since we were last here, it's how, travel, how stories travel the world, and how um, journalism is never going to be the same. WikiLeaks has had a special tie to Sweden because Julian Assange has been charged with two rape attempts in Sweden. But stories of all kinds have been traveling in a completely new way. The Arab Spring is an example of that. I had the 
chance to meet Vael Gunnen, who started it, and he was sitting in Dubai, and he put up a Facebook page where he was really pissed off at the Egyptian government. And it started spreading, and it started spreading, and after a while he called his boss at Google and said, hi, can I take a leave of absence for a month? I have some things I need to attend to in, in Egypt. And it's like, yeah, yeah, okay. And he comes there, and people want him to be the president of Egypt. Um, and also lines between content and between marketing is also blurring. More and more newspapers are creating content together with brands. Uh, and it's okay if it's not politics or news. We don't really care if a brand is involved, if the service is good for us. You can even take that one step further. It's called algorithm-driven journalism. And what is that? Well, it's when you just figure out what people would click on, and then you create those articles. So there's not an event. There was never anything happen, but if, for instance, I want to do this for Audi, I find out what people click for on Audi, and then I tell my 50 bloggers that I employ, write 10 articles each about Audi A2, connect them to each other, and then voila, uh, we get a lot of clicks. We ship them to Audi, who doesn't even know that uh, we're doing it this way, uh, but they get a lot of good clicks, so they pay for it. There's a company doing 70 million euros, uh, doing just this, they're on the stock exchange, they never speak to their clients. This is algorithm-driven journalism. If you tell any of your journalist friends that you like this, you'll have an argument that is really fun. They hate it, of course. And they also uh, are trying to start living with transparency, where, where uh, things like WikiLeaks is a new beast. And I'm friends with the uh, chief editor of New York Times, and they got all this information about Afghanistan, and they said, okay, if we publish this, people will be killed because they name the guys who are informants. They name everybody that helped the US government. So they said, we'll publish it, but without the names. Two weeks later, Wikipedia published it with names. So there is very dangerous, uh, with, with information without responsibility, it becomes very dangerous, but that's something we need to live with. We also had fun looking at which leaders followed each other on Twitter. So this is the Russian and the, the, the British, uh, the British uh, leader uh, following each other. Curiously enough, nobody was following the, the Canadian, uh, the Canadian uh, prime minister for some reason. But they can actually interact directly with top politicians in a way they haven't been doing before. And I was actually, uh, strangely enough, but I was invited last week to 10 Downing Street. So we were 50 entrepreneurs from different countries. And the prime minister was there for two and a half hours just listening to how could they make London a better place to start a company. So cities are starting to compete because where a lot of entrepreneurs come together, the ecosystem creates a lot of great entrepreneurship. And here Barcelona has a fantastic opportunity because everybody loves Barcelona. It's a friendly place, it's warm, it's beautiful, and there's a lot of support also from Barcelona Activa and the city. Uh, as I said before, the combination of media, the television that picks up what somebody filmed on their phone and a good story makes it very, very difficult to be a dictator nowadays. Almost whatever you do, you get busted, and that's something that creates a lot more honesty. So coming back to digital opportunities after this odyssey where we've been traveling around in some phenomena, um, I think there's more digital opportunities than ever before, and I think there's, for the first time, there's a new breed of companies. I call them multi-midgets. They're multinational, little small companies with 40 or 30 employees, or even smaller, that change the world. When I met Spotify the first time, there were a couple of friends sitting in Stock Stockholm saying, yeah, and then we get all the music on, and then we do this, and then we're going to raise the price, and this is going to happen. I said, good luck. And now they've changed the music industry fundamentally. I was with the Swedish head of, of uh, Universal, and we sat down, and he said, look at this, and he opened up Spotify's, uh, and, and he could see exactly who bought which song from him, and everybody who listened to each song, down on the nitty-gritty on each person in each city, and he said, it's fantastic. Before, I used to hate 18-year-old. They were thieves, they were stealing music, and Sweden, where I'm from, it's the home of, Pi uh, of Pirate Bay. Now, they're the best payers and users, because they love music. So, finishing up with the case Safari. Uh, I'm going to share the difference between three types of internet companies. The comet, the comet goes like, whoa, look at this, and then it goes away and you don't think about it for 300 years. Uh, that's the bad kind of company. That's like chat roulette. Chat roulette came and you can uh, speed date people because you could look at somebody, if you don't like their face, you click to the next guy and the next guy, so you could date 50 people in a minute. The problem was that guys started showing their penises 
and you don't want to have sort of to suffer 50 penises if you want to go on a date. Uh, so that started becoming a problem. So they figured out a way to recognize penises and then automatically redirect people to Hustler magazine, and then they got a click from Hustler magazine. That wasn't a sustainable business model either, so they went away. Um, now, there's a different type of company. Uh, they're called a planet. A planet shines because somebody puts a lot of light on it. Maybe it's called Groupon, maybe it's called something else. And then there are stars, companies that becomes part of the society and the way we live, the way we play, and the way we work. And one of them is QQ. QQ is one of the world's largest social platform. Started like a chat board in China. And they have around, I think it's 500 million Chinese on it right now. They have 102 business models, so they're very innovative. And one of them is that this penguin they're having here. The penguin, um, you, can, you can buy things for your avatar. So you can buy a Gucci bag for your avatar. And when they were uh, in, in, in not making their first sales quarter, they made the penguin ill. So when somebody came to your site, the penguin was going, Hachichi! and then you would have to pay 50 cents to cure your penguin. And all of a sudden, they made $50 million more, and off they went. So China's just a remarkable country. Japan too, Raokuten, one of the world's most successful e-commerce company. They say like, Amazon is good, but they don't really get it. We've figured it out. And pound for pound, they're very, very competitive. But they've connected points to credit cards, to delivery, to all kinds of things in an e-commerce ecosystem. And now they bought Price Minister in France and just rolling out Raokuten. So you're going to see them here soon as well. Tradition meets technology when uh, in this Indian site where you can marry your children away, very convenient. Uh, technology means very new traditions in India. Second Saudi, here you can get a second marriage. Uh, so the Indians are also embracing technology on a very rapid scale. We're going to meet Yuri from Ditto, uh, one of the most successful serial entrepreneurs from Finland, who's created Jaiku and sold it to Google. Uh, so he, he goes between Silicon Valhalla in the Nordics and Silicon Valley, and he's going to tell us about his new company, Ditto. Companies that are almost not companies. Instagram, four employees, five million users, 95 million photos. Blippi, a Facebook, not for you, but for your credit card. So every time you swipe your credit card, it gets the photo, the place, and then it connects to others that have bought the same thing. So it sparks a conversation. And I'm saying, that's crazy. I don't want anybody to see this. He said, well, you said the same thing about your Facebook photos 10 years ago. Now I saw your Ibiza photos, so I know you don't care about that. If it's more fun to show it, and if the conversation becomes greater, then you're gonna, uh, it's going to fly. Busu, if you want to learn languages, you can do it through Busu, growing like crazy, adding more and more languages, capitalizing on the fact that every Russian wants to learn English. Review Pro, native company out of here. So a big media director who leaves that, goes into starting his own company, and is now creating a completely new way for hoteliers to know how good they are around the world. And Fon, a company that I, that I was in a small way part of starting together with Martin Brzezowski, uh, where you share Wi-Fi somewhere at home, and then you can roam the world for free, connect to everybody else that likes to share. And it's also one of the most successful companies on an international basis because they're growing big time in Japan and in Russia and many other countries in the UK. Uh, I'm going to end with one last example, and that's what often happens when a director of a company, like many of you here, you listen to some guy like me, and then you go home and then you say, we're a truck company, but we should start a Facebook. Or you come up with a completely stupid idea. You draw the wrong conclusions. This happened when Scania, the truck company, they went to Syme and then they came back home and they, one guy convinced everybody else that they're going to start uh, Facebook for truck drivers. And they spent a lot of time and money and then they launched this. And I could have told them beforehand, it, it's not going to work. But it did. And internet often does. Crazy ideas work. So now, only in Sweden, small Sweden, 10,000 truck drivers every day are on King's Club because they drive four hours and they have to wait one hour and then they all log in, and check out the other drivers, connect with them and so forth. Uh, this has become, so 1,800 truck companies have joined. So now they sell their trucks using the input they get from this social network. And there's a trend to tattoo the logo of Scania on their arm to show that you're really a truck driver back to the bones uh, and you have your, your rig, your tattoos, your face and your friends. 
Anybody here that has uh, customers tattooing your logo on their arms? No one? And these guys are a truck company. So it's really, really exciting, and it's also very confusing. We know all these things, but still it's so difficult to see what works and how uh, it's, it's going to evolve. Um, I'm going to finish off with uh, a quote. This guy has been, been right before. If you think of everything that has changed the last 50 years, everything, and just think that the next 10 years will change a lot more, then it's a fantastic time to be living and doing business. Thanks.